We are your hosts, Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and you are listening to the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice, brought to you by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology to highlight work published in our peer-reviewed journal, AHIC. Join us as we speak to those in the field of infection prevention and control, like us, as well as other experts to learn about some of the latest research in the field and how it can be put into practice. We hope you will listen in, learn something new, and apply this information to your work. If you are not a researcher already, we hope this podcast will get you thinking about areas where you can carry out your own research. The articles we'll be talking about from AJIC's new issue today is Infection Preventionists' Experiences During the First Nine Months of the COVID-19 Pandemic, Findings from Focus Groups Conducted with Association for Professionals in Infection Prevention and Control and Epidemiology Members, and Rural Infection Preventionists' Experiences During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Findings from Focus Groups Conducted with Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Members. To link to the articles we are discussing today, go to our website at www.agicscienceintopractice.org. Hey, Jesse, let's play a game. You ready? Sure. Okay. I'm going to say a word, and you tell me the first thing that comes to mind, okay? Okay. Puppies. Cute. Books. Reading. Pizza. Mm, yummy. Mm, spiders. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. Butterflies? I'm um, pretty. Rain. Mm, gentle. COVID. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same here. <laughs> hey, what was your most prominent or frustrating memory of being an IP during the pandemic? For me, um, I would say it's probably around the fact that when COVID hit our hospital, infection prevention became the gatekeepers to everything. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. question that was asked came to the infection prevention team, um, whether it was um, visitor policies to PPE to fit testing, um, you know, anything you can think of, it was all infection prevention. Kind of a 24 hour, seven days a week experience, huh? Absolutely. Well, that's what we've got going on today. We're going to talk about infection preventionists' experiences during the first nine months of the pandemic. Jesse, who's our guests today? So here with us today to talk about this, we have Dr. Terry Redman, who is the Special Assistant to the President, Director of the Institute for Biosecurity, and a Professor of Epidemiology in the St. Louis University College for Public Health and Social Justice. She is a PhD nurse researcher, with an emphasis in infectious disease emergency preparedness. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Redman. Thanks for having me. Awesome. We also have with us today, Rebecca Alvino. Um, Rebecca is the field unit manager for hospital epidemiology and infection prevention at UCSF Health, specializing in perioperative and procedural infection prevention. Um, she originally began her career in public health during the early years of West Nile virus in upstate New York and became a surgical nurse in 2005, building the foundation for her knowledge and skills in perioperative and procedural infection prevention. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me today. So welcome, ladies. We're so excited to have you. All right. So, um... Dr. Rebman, do you want to kick us off by telling us a little bit about what prompted your research in the area of infection preventionists during COVID and the, the struggles that they were facing? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, well, first, I guess I should clarify. So this project was actually part of a project that was conducted by the APIC COVID-19 task force. And the task force had been working, looking at a number of different issues related to COVID-19 response and challenges that we were hearing anecdotally and formally from infection preventionists across the United States. So we had conducted a couple of surveys and we wanted to look at some of the issues in greater depth in a way that you can't collect information through a survey. And one way to do that is to conduct focus groups. And so we set up the focus groups in order to allow the infection preventionist time to really be able to reflect on their experiences and give us a lot of really rich detail about what they had been through. So give us some of the background on who you 
interviewed, what the, um, you know, what, what ages, where did they work? Were they certified versus not certified, et cetera, et cetera. So we tried to take um, a very broad approach to the groups that we were inviting. So we, we looked at different settings. So we had one focus group, for instance, that was only rural infection preventionists and another that was only infection preventionists in acute care settings. Um, and then we also had one that um, only involved new infection preventionists and one that only involved um, what we defined as experienced infection preventionists, those that had 10 years or more experience. And by having those different focus groups, we were able to look at, um, we wanted to be able to look at those specific issues within that sort of subpopulation. So what, was, what were some of the experiences for those that had more experiences versus, or more experience versus less experience? So nothing huge really popped out in those that had more experience um, what I recall, we heard more um, different experiences from the newer infection preventionists that they talked a lot about the challenges of how we're trying to um, transition into this new role and learn what IPC is at the same time, trying to handle all these challenges yeah. with the pandemic. And they, yeah. they just felt very overwhelmed with, you know, both of those things coinciding. That it is overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we actually had an infection prevention start um, in December before, you know, the pandemic really hit the United States. And so um, she has felt that her orientation was very challenging due to not having the capability of doing the standard IP work, um, but being sort of thrown into the, into the pandemic world that none of us were familiar with. Trial by fire. <laughs> so what story shocked you guys the most out of this it's an incredibly interesting two articles that we went through because some of the experiences are amazing i'm just curious any any story that stood out to you most you know for me i think it wasn't shocking but it was reassuring just through all the trials and tribulations that infection preventionists new and experienced rural urban or suburban have endured over these past several months, what really was reassuring was some of the rural, or yes, in the rural setting, some of the community support that was mentioned around donating PPE, donating supplies and materials, shifting, um, companies shifting their focus of what they manufacture to support their local healthcare facilities. I found that incredibly reassuring throughout mm -hmm all of the other experiences that were being shared by the infection preventionists, whether it was lack of PPE, um, trying to contend with disinformation or misinformation, that really for me provided some, some reassurance that the communities were stepping in in a big way and the IPs really had the support that they needed to continue to press on. I wanna say that I I'm glad to hear some good that happened with the IPs in their communities because some of the other stories were pretty shocking. I know, you know, some of the IPs in this, the paper were talking about people coming in off the streets and stealing PPE and um, pharmacists having to put sh pool shock into the, um, you know, mix that in to make bleach and cleaner. So it's good to hear that there's some positives that came from this. Yeah, it's interesting, Nikki, you mentioned the, um, the theft of PPE, because we actually saw that with H1N1 during the 2009 pandemic, oh. um, that this seems to be a recurring theme that we sort of learned it in 2009. And apparently between 2009 and, the, and COVID-19, we sort of forgot that you have to put that PPE away, especially right. when there are PPE shortages, because then it suddenly becomes a very hot commodity. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And speaking of uh, the relationship between IPs and the community and the community stepping in, one of the things I found fascinating was the relationship between IPs and staff and the relationship between IPs in the community. That seems to have changed quite a bit. Can you talk about that? Sure. I, I thought it, I found it the, the most touching to hear the, the rural IPs talk about their experiences and their relationships with their colleagues and with the community members that there was this um the the ips that work in rural areas expressed a sense of obligation 
to their community in a way that I didn't hear that from the suburban or urban IPs, that they felt like because it was such a small community in which they live and everyone knows who they are, that they had this, and they, they work in smaller teams, like their, their hospital or their setting is much smaller and they might be one person wearing five different hats. And so they felt this mm -hmm. huge sense of obligation and responsibility to their community, both at work and the, at the greater level of their community. Um, but then they also had this reciprocity. They expressed this incredible sense of support that they sort of received, you know, back from their community about because they are a small community and everyone knows each other, that they were really there to help support the IPs in a way that I, I didn't hear that same level of support coming through with the urban and the suburban IPs. And honestly, I, I wanted to let everybody know who's listening. The relationship between infection preventionists and staff has traditionally been um, we walk around with a clipboard and tell people that they're not washing their hands or doing this. So we're a certain type of figure. And I think that the pandemic changed how staff views the infection preventionists. And I think Jesse can talk about that a lot too. Yeah, we certainly um, became, I would say, um, in our rural hospital, a resource um, specifically to nursing, but to all the other areas in the hospital as well. Um, and definitely had an expectation of 24 seven coverage. Um, did the infection preventionists um, within the groups talk about, you know, the being on call and the struggle with um, work-life balance and even childcare or homeschooling during this time? Yeah, there were many of the IPs talked about the overwhelming sense, the overwhelming workload that they experienced during the pandemic. They were on call 24-7. There was this, there was more work than they could possibly manage. Um, and that it was just absolutely physically and emotionally exhausting for them to, to be seen as this um, paragon of, of best practices and the expert in infection prevention at a time when everyone needed this information. And so they were constantly being peppered with all of these questions and, and they were also being peppered with a lot of, um, in some cases, distrust because of all the changing and the and the conflicting guidelines in many situations, um, many of the IPs felt like they were being, like their own expertise was being questioned at times. And it was difficult for them to give evidence-based answers when the evidence was either lacking or conflicting. And so that was really challenging for IPs in all settings. They all mentioned this, new IPs, experienced IPs, regardless of where they worked, that changing and conflicting guidelines seemed to be a common theme of one of the biggest challenges that they faced. I think yeah, you refer I, to that in the paper as change fatigue. Yeah, I yeah. was actually gonna ask that as the next question and you just transitioned right into it. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we faced also was that not all of the decisions being made were made by infection prevention, but you know were very infection prevention related. Um, did the IPs in these um, rural hospitals talk about where the um, decisions were being made, if they were allowed to provide any input and sort of how that um, either helped them or hindered them in any way? Yeah, the, so this was one of the more, to me, one of the most interesting findings that there was um, a lot of variation. So in some settings or with some infection preventionists, they had a seat at the table and their opinion was sought about what is the best practice and protocol for this situation. And then among a large number of infection preventionists, they were completely um, left out of those conversations. So those infection prevention protocols are being developed by people that don't have that IPC expertise. And so the infection preventionists were very um, frustrated and then they had to implement those protocols that weren't necessarily evidence-based all the time, and, but they didn't have any input. And so, so the, oh, sorry, why was that? Ha well, that's, I, I wonder why that was happening. What, it, that kind of brings me back to the relationship with IPs and staff, including IPs and administration, you know, executive staff. I can see Why? how that could create some distrust amongst the staff when you're telling them to do something that, you know, you know yourself may not be fully evidence-based, but you're being asked by your senior leadership to do that. 
Yeah, I definitely sensed a lot of frustration for those IPs that were not, that did not have a seat at the table, that were not able to provide that level of expertise and help inform um, local and regional and even federal policy. Um, that was one of the big findings from the, this project was that um, we've said for a long time it, it, through APIC that infection preventionists have this this area of expertise and that they need to be involved in developing policies that are related to IPC. But what we've seen historically over and over again with outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases with bioterrorism attacks or threats of bioterrorism and pandemics, that many times the IPs are left out. And so it they really, we, we need um, healthcare and public health as a whole to recognize the importance of infection preventionist and the expertise that we bring and that we do need to have a seat at the table to join in these conversations so that our policies and protocols really are evidence-based. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So do you think that administration and executive teams are just not used to having IPs at the table and that's why they were being left out? Rebecca, Anybody? maybe since I work at a university, I've been out of like the healthcare direct role for a number of years. Now, Rebecca, maybe you could comment on this? Yeah, I, I think that sometimes it's taken for granted or it's just seen that infection prevention is, is something that you have to have as part of a regulatory requirement. So that mm -hmm. person, especially mm -hmm. in the rural setting is not just the infection preventionist, but they're also the employee health person. They may also be the risk manager, the quality person. So they're wearing a lot of hats, which to yeah. me says that there may be an under resourcing in that facility or an undervaluing of the need to have somebody dedicated to the work of infection prevention and control. It's pretty multifactorial, but I think that this pandemic has really provided an opportunity, as Dr. Edmund said, to shine a light on the expertise that needs to be at the table. Hopefully uh, studies like this, papers like this, and this body of work will help to further awaken our executives and administrators to see that it really is necessary to start very early on in an event like this with having the infection preventionist at the table to inform and influence decision making. Basically, Absolutely. the infection preventionist is looked at as the cop. You know, you walk around and you enforce. You're not a policy creator, you're an enforcer. So that, and is it, that should shift. Yeah, it is a very tough persona to try to break. Infection preventionists have historically, as you said, been have been seen as sort of the enforcer, the police officer for hand hygiene, the hand hygiene police. I've heard many things myself over the years, but now there really is a new light illuminated on the role of infection preventionists and where we can be and how we are valued in events that play out like this. But the important thing, I think also for healthcare workers, for staff, for executives and administrators to keep in mind is that expertise evolves as the science evolves. And this is one of the challenges, as Dr. Rutman said, was resonated throughout all of the groups that as the science evolved, there was a lot of conflicting guidance. There was a lot of distrust that would be created as we saw with some of the larger health systems where maybe there was a larger facility that had one set of protocols, for example, that were developed. And then clinicians from that facility would go to a smaller facility or critical access hospital and say, well, why are you doing it this way? Mm -hmm. This is how we do it here. Mm -hmm. Really yep. not playing to the fact that the resources just aren't the same in that smaller facility that exactly. they yep. yeah, have we, the re larger facility. We saw that as well. We got a lot of um, phone calls and emails about your providers are telling us we need to do it this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Um, and another um, factor in all of this is, as we know, although everyone believes that now there's the only infection type that you can get is COVID, there are um, other infections still occurring um, throughout the hospitals that we have to, you know, continue to look for and continue to, to mitigate. So, you know, that work didn't stop. How did the infection preventionists handle doing their standard work in addition to having to take on all of this other COVID-related work? Yeah, that was a major challenge expressed by um, almost all of the infection preventionists that um, because COVID became this 24-7 job, that routine surveillance and, and routine infection prevention practices 
either had to take get set on the back burner or there had to be a new prioritization about what was going to happen. And there was this recognition among them that they, they knew that there was going to be this impact on healthcare associated infections. And some of them talked about um, increases they were starting to see in HAIs. Um, and some of them expressed worry that maybe there was an increase and they weren't even detecting it because they were so busy with the COVID-19 work that they didn't have time to really investigate in the same way they would um, when there wasn't a pandemic happening. Yeah, because I can imagine if you are um, part-time quality, part-time infection prevention, part-time director of nursing education and OC Med, you know, that you're already trying to do 24-7 COVID. So you have all these other things on your plate. There's no way you're going to keep up with all of the HAI work as well. That just, it doesn't make sense. I wonder too, I, I feel like the increase in the HAIs is is definitely multifactorial, right? So, I mean, we saw n nurses um, and physicians experiencing extreme burnout, um, working long hours, um, staffing and, and shortages and and all of that included. So I, I can imagine that that all contributed to these increases in HAIs. And then in addition to that, we don't even have time to work to continue our mitigation practices at the same time. It's just, it, it's, it's so crazy. You know, I thought it was so interesting that some of the IPs reported an increase in HAIs due to visitor restrictions. Do you guys want to talk about that at all? That's interesting. Yeah, that, that was something that surprised me as well. I guess I had never made that connection between um, having visitors available in the hospital to help with patient care. Um, and it, what, the, what the IPs were reporting is that when those visitors were restricted, then there was no one to help alert the nurse or the medical staff that there, something new was happening or there was a problem with the wound or, or whatever, or they weren't rolling the patient as often and helping getting the patient to sit up. And so we started to see this connection between visitors and it, possibly HAIs, but definitely just patient care in general, that I had not made that connection prior to the IPs talking about that. Well, that would be an interesting area of study is the relationship between visitor patient advocacy and quality of care. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's yeah really I would love to see that data. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. So some of the other anecdotes that struck me, one in particular, was one of the IPs that said, I think this, I think the scariest thing is just people trusting what I say when I'm not 100% sure that what I'm saying is correct. And that kind of goes back to creating policies and trying to grab a hold and, and lead all of these policies and these interventions and really just being scared because, Jesse, we talked about this before. What about the marathon comment? Oh, right. So, yeah, I, I what stuck with me was somebody saying to an IP, this is a marathon, but then the IP reflecting and saying, you know, marathon runners, they have all this um, training and time to prepare. And we got hit with this fairly rapidly without a lot of time to get PPE ready, staff ready, do training, um, educate and all of those things. So, I thought that was really um, an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was also this, this sense that um, some infection preventionists have difficulty communicating information about changing protocols when the science is shifting quickly. And we, I heard this during the H1N1 pandemic as well, and also during the Ebola crisis. So every time we have an outbreak of an emerging infectious disease where, where the information, the science is changing very, very quickly. There's this balance between you need to communicate, like here's what we know today and we're basing our decisions off the best science we have today. And if you don't sort of add that little disclaimer, then what ends up happening is as soon as the science changes and it, it changes, of course, then you hear this distrust from the staff Mm -hmm. or, or you might not even feel confident about what it is that you're saying because yeah. the science is shifting. I think so that I think really, you, yeah, I think that impacts your relationship with the community too, because part of, you know, somebody said that uh, the health of the community weighs on their shoulders because you're engaging 
on social media, um, people are very distrustful and questioning. So your relation, I think the IP relationships with everybody surrounding them happen to change drastically. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Um, did any of the infection preventionists talk about using some form of social media to try to provide education or, you know, get people out there wearing masks and and or isolating or um, doing the other things that we were hearing, you know, that we should be doing to help stop the spread? So... Oddly, what we, what we heard was the opposite, and it might have just been the timing of the pandemic. So keep in mind that th this was conducted about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, IPs had been drowning in COVID-19 for nine months. So they hadn't, I don't know how much time they had really had to be more proactive in terms of reaching out and using social media to help spread the positive messages and more of that evidence-based science. Um, so instead, what I heard from the IPs is that um, the, they had social media challenges that they were experiencing where there was so much misinformation um, and disinformation that was provided through social media. And they felt like they were constantly fighting that battle of, you know, masks, the science behind mask use, and then later, you know, the science behind the vaccine. And so social media was in some ways kind of fighting their efforts to share the true science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the I can see IP. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is a battle. And I know some of the rural IPs mentioned getting some unsettling messages through social media. So there, there was a hysteria that I think IPs caught a lot of brunt of. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of uh, the other infection preventionists that I no, we actually went off social media for a month. At, mm -hmm. I think we actually stayed off longer than that because it was refreshing. And every time we went on, we felt this sense of frustration. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as a result of that, we said, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go off. And it, I think it was, it was definitely better for our mental health in the long run. So absolutely. I'll agree with that. <laughs> I had to do yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of emotional impact and frustration you know, it stems from all this distrust and fear and skepticism and credibility issues. So, yeah, I think I think a lot of IPs probably had to take a break from social media. Did yeah. you hear of any infection preventionists that were either struggling with whether or not they wanted to stay in their role or if they were planning to forge ahead, even though they've been through this sort of life altering, very stressful situation throughout the pandemic? Yeah, the, the IPs that participated in the focus groups were all extremely dedicated to infection prevention, even though many of them were exhausted, um, on the edge of burnout, the way they described it, physically, emotionally exhausted. Um, my guess is that infection preventionists that were so burned out that they were thinking about leaving the field probably just decided, did not respond to our request for people to participate in the focus group. Um, but anecdotally, I did hear, um, and I'm sure others of you have heard this as well, that there were IPs that chose to leave the field or retire early rather than um, continue in this very exhausting role as the pandemic has stretched on. Um, were there any findings that you can think of throughout this um, study that you thought were most surprising, things that you didn't expect either the IPs to come forth with the, the two things that sort of stood out to me the most, mo and we've talked a lot about the experiences of the rural IPs, a lot of that information was very surprising to me. But the other thing that I found, or the other sort of theme and area that I found surprising was the immense challenges that IPs that work in long-term care expressed. And I, my experience was not in long-term care when I worked in infection prevention, I worked in acute care. And so to hear they had such unique challenges in terms of lack of PPE because it was prioritized for the acute care settings. They had the testing requirements that we didn't have in most acute care settings, at least in a, a, a much more dramatic exponential kind of way. Um, and then there was this theme among all of the non-acute care IPs, all said that the major thing lacking from their perspective was that there really wasn't any setting specific guidance available to them that 
if you look at like the CDC guidance, um, almost all of it is focused on acute care settings. And so IPs that work in home health or long-term care just said, some of these guidelines don't make any sense for, for our healthcare personnel. And there was just this sort of void about how do we, how do we make decisions about PPE use when a nurse has to go into a patient's home? To provide right, because care. trying to translate acute care interventions into long-term or home health interventions is incredibly difficult. You don't have the same resources. Yeah, and I think the other thing is um, that Nikki and I were actually talking about earlier is that when you're the only IP, as we've mentioned in a lot of these rural long-term care facilities and critical access hospitals, you are it, you are the only one, is how do you not feel alone in all of this? How do you, and with 24-7 being bombarded, how do you have a phone a friend or you know somebody that you can feel like you can reach out to for assistance did did they create any sort of um any sort of groups together did anybody have a phone a friend system did they do anything like that to sort of not feel so alone yeah one of the the bright spots that i really heard from the rural infection preventionist is that the the silver lining of the pandemic if you if you can call it that was that the APIC meetings became virtual. And so it allowed them to attend and participate and connect with other IPs in a way that they couldn't before the pandemic. So the rural IPs in particular really leaned on their um, APIC colleagues to get more information, to get support, to just reach out and have someone to run questions past. And they found that immensely helpful. So they found that connection through APIC in a way that I didn't hear from um, some of the other IPs. I wanted to ask a question about IP staffing in long-term facilities. CMS has indicated that long-term care facilities have to have an IP staff, but I know a study in 2020 indicated that IP staffing levels had not changed significantly. Do you all know what that meant exactly? Were some still without IP staff at all? Or does it relate back to what you said earlier where IP is hired as a regulatory thing and the importance and resources that go to it are few and far? Yeah, so that that particular comment was citing another study. So I, I hope I'm not misinterpreting that study. But my my understanding is that when CMS made that requirement, the way that many long-term care facilities addressed that regulatory requirement is that they took a non-IP, someone without IP experience and expertise, and said, you are the infection preventionist. And they didn't give them that training and mentoring that we normally give to new IPs to help them transition into that role. And so the way the research Research looked at it was there really wasn't a change in infection prevention expertise in these mm -hmm. settings. Mm -hmm. it, there was just a checkbox that was being mm -hmm. checked. What an uh oh moment for a pandemic like this where long term care facilities were being hit so hard. And what an uh oh moment for the person who then became responsible for infection <laughs> yeah. prevention without training. <laughs> yes, very scary, very scary. Um, one of the other questions um, that came to mind when we were talking about the lack of PPE was we know that there were companies and other organizations that donated various items for PPE, but do you think um, that there was a higher level of PPE compliance and hand hygiene compliance during this time based on what these IPs were seeing or were they not even able to monitor something like this because of time constraints? I think the experiences were um, quite varied in terms of PPE <laughs> compliance because there were some IPs that reported that early on every the healthcare personnel were very careful and stringent about using PPE and then as time went on they started to see this PPE fatigue that people became tired of wearing masks and respirators and all of the PPE and the eye protection and so they just started making small mistakes. So there was a lot of that expressed, but then there was also, uh, there were other IPs that said, because there was so much fear and concern about COVID-19, that many of the healthcare personnel were more careful about making sure they had the right PPE, 
And if they perceived that they didn't have the correct PPE, then they were very worried about um, their own safety if they weren't provided an N95 respirator, for instance, or if they were asked to reuse that respirator, there was concern expressed. I think we saw some similar um, things, sort of both ends of the spectrum there. Um, did they also mention, because I know this is something that a lot of facilities were trying to do as a result of the not having all of the PPE available, but did any of them mention having to do decontamination processes for their masks in order to reuse them and how that went? A few. There wasn't a lot of conversation around decontamination of respirators. There were, you know, a random comment here or there about usually in sort of that broader context of about PPE concerns. And there were, when the topic of PPE came up during each focus group, the IPs just kind of let loose. They had so many different PPE concerns. Um, decontamination of respirators was just one of those small concerns. And so the lack of PPE, I, I believe, seemed to be the bigger issue than decontaminating. Yeah, I bet. Um, were there some interesting stories about things that were either donated or that ha were had to be used for PPE that wouldn't normally be used? Yeah, there were some really sad stories about um, some facilities needing to go to trash bags um, instead of because mm -hmm. they didn't have enough isolation gowns. Um, or, but sometimes there were uplifting stories about communities that pulled together. Um, plastic companies that repurpose their equipment to make face shields or to make homemade pappers. So the, the responses were really um, on, on both ends of the continuum. I noticed that rural IPs probably had to deal with that a little more and do some pretty creative and inventive approaches, you know, making their own videos using cloth gowns and having 3D printed masks from the community. So I think you're right. The differences between the rural IPs and the big hospitals were definitely had their unique challenges. Yeah, so much so when, when we first put together the focus groups, our intention was to only have one focus group with the rural IPs. And it was one of the earliest focus groups that we did. And it ran longer than any other focus group that we conducted. And the issues were so different than what we were hearing from the other IPs that we actually added a whole second mm. Mm -hmm. rural IP focus group just to gather more of that. And they just had so much they needed to share. Mm. Um, so as we wrap things up today, um, we'd like to thank you both for joining us and mm -hmm. ask if you have any final thoughts or what the action piece is that we should take from these focus groups. So to me, I, I think that there are two, two of the most important action steps include one that there, we need to have a change in healthcare and public health so that infection preventionists start to have a role in these conversations around emergency management and how to develop crisis standards of care and helping to develop these evidence-based protocols. And then second, we need to start, we need to have more of a focus on our PPE supply chains so that we don't end up in the same situation that we were in for most of the beginning of the pandemic where there was a lack of PPE, we had healthcare workers wearing trash bags. I mean, we have plenty of time to now address those supply chain issues so that we don't run into these same issues in the next event that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pandemic preparedness, which uh, none of us really, I know that some of us went through Ebola and H1N1, but this was a whole new beast. Yeah, I absolutely hope that you're right, that this does shine a light on the importance of infection preventionists across the country and that they're, you know, sort of lifted up and given the level of uh, respect and appreciation that they deserve as they've worked through this and, you know, been on that 24-7 coverage and dealt with um, both the community and the staff and taken all of that on because it's been quite something that we can all, I think, commiserate with each other about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, ladies, very, very much for coming on and speaking with us about this today. I'm sure that this is a conversation that could go on for days. We could have a whole session, a whole 
a whole podcast dedicated to this in and of itself. So thank you guys for coming on and sharing your time. Yeah, thanks so much. It was it was really interesting and it was great hearing from both of you. Well, thank you for joining us today. We are Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and this is the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice. Thanks for listening and doing your part to prevent infection, because remember, infection prevention is everybody's business. To hear other AGIC podcast episodes and to access information about this podcast in the field of infection prevention and control, go to our website at agicscienceintopractice.org. That's A-G-I-C, scienceintopractice.org. AGIC Science Into Practice is created by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology with input from the APIC Research Committee and Pat Stone and Jean Brandt at AGIC and APIC staff, Lisa Tomlinson, Liz Garman, Bobby Golshin, Chris Ruiz, Kelly Lynn Russell, Sylvia Quavedo, Kaylee Deaton, and Christine Miller. We work in partnership with Human Factor and Audio Tech Blake Alton.